Okay, so we left off yesterday talking about what kind of engine? Radial. Radial. Is this a gnome type? No. Heavens no. Okay, so it's just a regular radial engine. Regular. <coughs> Sorry, coronavirus. I'm catching it. <laughs> too soon, too soon. All right, so we said it comes in multiple sections. Uh, well, the opposed has two sections, the right and left for the most part. Um, not interchangeable match set. The radial engines have three to seven sections. Um, you know, I don't think, I, some of them are match sets, but I don't think the whole thing is a match set. And I'm saying I think. I'll always tell you when I don't know. Um, I believe these two are definitely a match set because it's the power section, but I believe you can uh, change out the nose and uh, the back sections. They're not necessarily matched. So maybe I'm wrong on that. But anyway, three to seven sections. And what are my sections? All right. Um, there we go. You're always going to have a front, well that makes sense, right? A front, or sometimes called the nose section, nose section. And the nose section is important because without it you don't have a front of an engine. Um, because it usually, it usually, and when I say usually it means like all the ones I've ever seen, contains the thrust bearing thrust bearing. Now the thrust bearing is an important point when you, in engines, it's something we haven't even talked about yet, but we have to think it through and you think it about, okay, so you've got even your engine or radial, they're all the, all the same in this respect, you've got a flange or you've got something that the propeller attached to and the propeller is thrusting and pulling forward, which then pulls on the crankshaft, right? And the crankshaft has then got to touch the engine somewhere and pull on the engine case, and the engine case is going to pull on the motor mounts, which then pulls on the airframe, pulls the thing. So at some point, you have to have that transfer of thrust from the propeller to crankshaft, which is bolted to it, but the crank to the crank case. And that's an important point. Have you guys noticed where your thrust bearing is on your Lycoming? No. Silence and crickets. It's on number one uh, main journal, right? <coughs> Uh, kind of, kind of. Well, in radial engines, <clears throat> in higher horsepower engines, you guys have plane bearings. We're going to talk about plane, plane, plane as in like normal, not plane as in like airplane. Uh, plane bearings, but radial engines use uh, not plane bearings. They use ball bearings and roller bearings. They just happen to have a big old ball bearing right here, thanks to Prince. Actually, this is the little ball bearing. You want to see the big ball bearing? <clears throat> <laughs> I'm not even sure. Boy, you can even feel the um, centrifugal force of it. All right, so, um, sorry, I got it. Anyway, so this is a ball bearing because it has balls in here. We'll talk more about that. But up in the nose section, you're going to find ball bearings. This is about the size of a Continental 220. So this is just going to be a probably bigger radial engine, and this is probably more around the crankshaft. But so this is not an uncommon size for a small radial engine uh, bearings. So you'll see ball bearings up in the front, in the nose section. In fact, it goes right in this section right there is where that bearing is going to fit, and there's going to be a cap that's going to go over it. And so that's where all the thrust from the propeller is sent through here into the case, and then. The rest of it, yeah. How often do you change the thrust? Every overhaul. Every overhaul. Yeah. Like, it's funny. So some of these radial engines, especially the old ones, like you get in World War II, the overhaul period was really short. I think like a Continental 220 radial was like 500 hours. And the reason why is, best I can tell, is you know labor was really cheap back then. And they didn't have you change out all the parts. It was funny how little you would change out in parts. So it was more, mostly just to tear down, kind of inspect, put in some new bearings, and back to the race as it went. Blue right. oil wasn't so great in those days either. That is true. <laughs> all right, so front contains the nose section. What else we got here? We had the main or power section. Main, main section. Or I like to call it the power section. power section. That is where it was. it's going to house uh, where the rods are going to come out of. 
and sometimes it could be a one or two piece, one or two piece construction. Sometimes it's split, sometimes it's not. Then we'd have the diffuser. or blower section, or supercharger section if you want, or blower section. Uh, the Continental 220, the, sm the smallest radio, that I'm, well, it's not the smallest one, it's kind of one of the smaller of the common ones. Uh, it does not have a diffuser section, but then we get, move up one size into the light combing. The light combing did run a diffuser section, so if you look back there, it just looks like a giant in, uh, centrifugal impeller that actually brings in the fuel air mixture from the carburetor and the light combings didn't supercharge it. It just used that spinning device to um, distribute the fuel and air out. But then you get into the bigger ones, uh, Pratt & Whitney. They do actually run the diffuser fast enough that it, it's uh, supercharging. And then anybody care to guess the last one I'll throw in here? Yeah, the yep, accessory. Rear or accessory section. And that's going to where all your accessories are going to bolt onto. And so what accessories can we have on here? Oil pump, Oil pump fuel pump, fuel pump. Uh, magnetos. magnetos. That was a good one. Yeah, there we go. Wait. So you said the front section housed the thrust bearing? Yep. What held the bearing in the front section? It's actually, uh, it's a, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's a cap. It's like a cap that just goes over it. And it's got a big thrust nut on it. So you adjust the thrust nut to... To hold it in. I think it's called the thrust plate. Let's hold the thrust nut. All right. Um, let me see. I've got. Huh? Back up. You're really taking my time now. Ready? All right. I got a lot here. I'm going to skip through some of this a little bit, but I'm just going to make a note so I can just kind of mention it to you. And you know that if I'm just sort of mentioning it to you, it's just something I'd like you to know, but I'm probably not going to ask you on a test, or it may apply to you out in the shop. So let's see. On Lycoming, well, let me see. Well, let's put this opposed. Back to talking about some opposed engines. P P O S E D. Opposed engines use through bolts. And you've now experienced through bolts, correct? Yes. All right, so you have the Lycoming 0290. What kind of through bolts do you have? Let me just tell you what, there's two types. And you can figure out what type. There's two types. Two types. There is the fixed type, fixed, or sometimes I call them anchored, or floating. What type do you have? Floating. Try one more time. Fixed. <laughs> fixed. Fixed. You have fixed through studs. Well, what is the difference? Most engines these days, most modern engines, are actually not using uh, what you have, the, the anchored. Now, let's see if we can get a more, here we go. So here's kind of a more modern looking light coming right here. Notice there are no studs anywhere in any of these spots, except for here. So this one has, what kind are these? Fixed. Probably fixed or anchored. This doesn't always have to be. So like yours, um, they're up on, well, you're, you have it on the nose to so the very top on one side. You actually had the, the stud was kind of flush. You can just see it there. A lot of times that one's floating, and you have nuts right there, cylinder-based nuts. You're like, why are they up here for no reason? Well, that's because it's a floating. So the floating ones actually literally just float in between. So when you're taking them apart, you would actually take off the nuts, and you just drive the drive that stud right out, just pull it right out, and set it on the table. Well, isn't there two floating on our engines? Nah, uh, you They're don't have any floating. By the flange? Well, or like oh, those are just those are small bolts, three eighths bolts. So you're right. So they're same same concept. Um, there. So this one has. Mm, they could be anchored. They could just be sitting there. Probably anchored. So there's there was that. Um, just know that there's different types. So if you're working on an engine, almost all Continentals are this way. And you're like, 
whoa, it just came out. Did I break it? No, nah, it's supposed to come out that way. So it's, it's, it's more common that they're floating. Uh, let's see. Floating. I want to talk about sealants. Yeah. You mentioned yesterday that like, sometimes you can get the mains to, to spin around if they're not, if those bolts are not tight. Ah, good segue to where I'm going here. And so the question is, um, say you are only going to change one cylinder. Are you concerned about spinning a bearing because you have to move the engine? Make sure I answer this question where I'm going with this. Okay. All right. So if we go back to here and you kind of looked at how your engine came apart. This parting flange does not have a gasket. But yet if it's not sealed, you're going to get oil everywhere. So how do they seal these things? Very carefully. This brown stuff right here is called pliobond and it's like a sticky kind of stuff. And honestly, I think the pliobond is just the stickiness is really there to hold this string. And this string is silk thread. And it's very important that you use the exact size silk thread in there. Uh, light combing uses one size, Continental uses another. Light combing is thinner, Continental is a little bit bigger. Uh, light combing tells you just to use I think, triple aught, um, triple aught silk thread and no specific part number. Continental has a specific part number and it's thicker, I measured it. So anyway, so you put this plyo bond in here. Now light combing does have some other um, options for you. You can use plyo bond. There's this stuff called, um, uh, what is it? Loctite 515, 515 I think it is. Um, I always wanna say 505, but it's 515. It's a red stuff. Continental likes to use that a lot. Continental is weird. They actually have you put this brown stuff on one side and this red stuff on the other side, two completely different products and put it together. I don't know how they figure that works, but it works. So you have to be very careful on how you do this. I stole these pictures off the internet and now that I, I say that and I look at it, I don't know if you can tell, but can you see the difference between maybe that silk thread and, I don't know if I took that picture or just stole off the internet. This I stole off the internet. This is not small silk thread. That is a shoelace. <laughs> that is a shoelace and a half. And here's what's gonna happen with this. When you use the improper sealants in here, maybe, you, and, and Lycoming does have a certain uh, RTV, which is room temperature vulcanizing, which is like a silicone. I've never used that particular product. Uh, but some people just use like high temp RTV. It's like, oh, any sealant will work. Just put it in there so it doesn't leak. It's not about the leakage. It's a, it's a metal to metal surface that is, when you put it together, you have a, a specific bearing bore that is a critical size, right? And, and that's where you're going. Your question is that bearing bore. So number one, you have your cam bore, which has no bearings in it, right? So you just bring it together, you have two half circles, and that's gotta be the perfect circle for the, the cam to fit in there. What if those two half circles are smaller than the cam? Okay, the cam is gonna seize up in there. So same thing, but now with the crankshaft, we're gonna put bearings in there. So what if the hole that the, the crank makes, we put the bearing halves in there and we bolt it together and it's too tight. It smashes the bearings, what's gonna happen? It won't even turn, it'll lock up on it. One of our engines, I red tagged it thankfully from last year, we could not get that thing to work. There's something wrong with the way the case was bored and every time the group bolted together, it seized up on the crankshaft in one spot. So uh, we don't have that one. But anyway, so you have that problem. So it's, that's not a real common problem. So this is what really happens with, with all these engines. You get something like this, and uh, I'm just gonna you know, throw it out there. This is the improper thread. I'm just looking, I never noticed it before, but this is, this is gonna be a problem. So we talked about if it's too tight, what if it's too loose? Okay, so, it's, so number one, if, it, if we could somehow shim it and it was just too big, we're gonna have slop in there. Is too much clearance between the crank and bearings. It's actually called that crank and bearing clearance. So there's too much in there. You're depending on the oil to fill that up, and it can move around in there, and that's bad, and think bad things can happen. But here's what usually happens. So you're gonna put the wrong thread in there, and then it's usually a double mistake. And then whoever does, did this doesn't know, since they don't know that, they're gonna not know the next thing, that it's gotta be a wet torque. So they're gonna put this big silk, this rope in here. They're gonna to torque it together and use a dry torque, which is about how, what percent am I losing, guys? You're gonna lose about 40% of your torque. Even if they 
did it right, well, it just compounds that they didn't torque it enough, but let's just say they even did it right. So they torque it, they got this rope in here, which is spacing things apart. So what's gonna happen is this case is gonna wear a little bit because it's being held apart by this rope. And what it's gonna do is gonna wear, I'm gonna call it rope, <laughs> this string. It's gonna wear off this string. And because it wears it out, now what did you have left in there? You got a space. Okay, so the crankcase is gonna do this and it's gonna move. That's called fretting. It's actually they call it fretting corrosion, but what it is, it's just two pieces working and it shows up as a, a light frosting. So I, I could show every one of you guys your crankcase where there's a little, ours are in pretty good shape, but a little bit of light frosting right next to where the bearings are and this area right here when you take it apart. So what happens is you start losing material. All right, then everything starts to get loose and you can get to a point where the bearings start to work in there. You can see how they kind of rotate and will we'll start to dig into the case nav next to it. Okay, but that's not the problem. So that goes fine. You're going to see oil leaks and then you're going to see cylinder base studs starting to pop off. And we'll talk more about torquing. But uh, you want the torque on the cylinder base studs to be of a higher, of a higher loading than what the cylinders ever face, right? So they're under more stress. You preload them to, to a higher stress than the cylinder ever puts on it. And the reason why you do that is because every time that the cylinder fires, it's trying to blow the head right off of it, the cylinder right off. But if the nuts are tighter than that, that pressure, then nothing happens, everything stays. But if the bolts are under less of a load, then they stretch every time that happens, all right? Every time they do that. And so they stretch and they work harder and then they just fall off. And so eventually enough of them fall. And so you'll see somebody has that problem of coming in the shop all the time, say, lost another stud. Yeah, it's because it was dry torque. But anyway, so this all starts happening. Then if the engine isn't condemned at some point where somebody says, look, this thing's got to come apart. Eventually what happens is somebody, uh, they come in for their annual inspection. You do a cylinder compression test. You're like, well, you got a bad cylinder. That cylinder has to come off. So the un poor unsuspecting mechanic you guys go, okay, well, I'm a good mechanic. I'm going to take this cylinder off. You're going to send it out. You're going to have a fix. You're going to bring it back. You're like, I know how to do engines because Kevin taught me. I know it's a wet torque. I know it's going to take a lot of oil. And I know that I'm going to torque the backside too because you got the through bolt. You can't just, especially the floating, you can't do one side. You got to do both sides. So you're going to do it right. You put the cylinder on. You're going to torque it. And guess what? All that fretting, you lost material. So a little bit of the crankcase is constantly wearing out and falling into the oil. But now you're missing material. So you torque it down all the way nice and tight like you're supposed to. What did you just, what did you just do? You just crushed the bearing right into the crank, crankshaft. But you don't know any better. Because how can you? You didn't know that the last person screwed this all up. So maybe it works okay until the crankshaft turns blue and the engine has a catastrophic failure. It wasn't your fault. You did the right thing. But that's one of the bad things. Now, light combing had, I, I can't find it anymore, but I know in an old book somewhere, and I read it, and it was really cool. I remember the picture in my head. They had a, it was a service bulletin, and it said, this could happen. So to protect yourself, what you should do is take shot bags or bags of sand or something that have a known weight or whatever before you take the engine apart. So like take all the plugs out and everything. Figure out exactly how much torque it takes to make the cylinder go around. Note that. Do your work, put the new cylinder on, and see if it changed. If it changed, you could have a problem. That's not an active service bolt anymore. I don't know what happened to it, and I've never talked to anybody who even, you know, remembers that, but I kind of remember it. Maybe I'm just that old. So, anyway, so that's the, that's the bad side. That could happen. So, you got to make sure that you use the right stuff not just silk thread. It's got to be the right silk thread. It's got to be the right sealant. And what can I say? I have all these notes in here, but I'm not going to go into it. Sealant. Um, I will just say this. What's that? So you'd say, you said how much torque it takes. Measure the amount of torque. Yeah, it's actually the picture had you place a little sandbag. Um, so like you put the propeller horizontal, and then you put a sandbag out until it moved it. And then you marked where that sandbag at that particular weight, there's something like that, moved it. <laughs> I always just make a point of, you know, right before I take a cylinder off, I'll kind of, you know, at least verify that, see what it feels like, and then you can tell. Um, you'll get these engines out in the field that have sealant just packed all along the back of the, 
the crankcase. And you're like, yeah, this thing's got a problem. But is there a chance that the bearing bearings will spin uh -huh. if you're just replacing one cylinder? Mm -hmm. There's a chance. I've never heard of it, but it could happen. Yeah. The thread that, that you get, like, does it literally come in like a spool of thread, or does it come in like the shape already? Nope. So the light combing, light combing, uh, it takes double lot, that's zero, zero, that's how you say that, double lot silk thread, silk thread, and guess where I bought our silk thread? Amazon. I was in Michael's. Were you Michael's? Yeah, what do I, I just didn't want to leave the house. Because, and now, am I breaking the law? Yeah. Why? No accountability. But if light combing says, just use some double aught silk thread. There's no part number, no traceability, no accountability. And, and you call Lycoming and you say, I need to order some double aught silk thread. And they say, sell that stuff. You just go to Michael's and get it. Or Hobby Lobby. Okay, let's turn it around. Continental. It says, use Continental part number 649182. I made up the part number. It does start with a six, though. Now, can I, and, and, I, and, I, and I go get some, and I measure it with the micrometer. I'm like, ah, this is single lots. And I, and I go on Amazon. Can I do that? No. That's totally different. So, so, plus, I'm only using it on stuff here. So, we use double lot silk thread and POB, POB number four. And I think POB stands for ply O bond. According to, I'm not going to write this. According to the guy at Lycoming, when I went to Lycoming school, he said, I'll quote, the silk thread will eventually wear out, only leaving the plyo bond. I'm going to differ with him on that one. If the case doesn't move, then the silk thread won't go anywhere. And I've taken apart engines that were well put together after a thousand hours, and there was a little bit of silk thread, and it was still there. So the case doesn't move. It should, that should still be there. So I'm not even going to write that. Uh, Continental. Continental. Continental engine, the gold engine. Um, how much do I want to write there? I'll just put this. They use grade D, grade D silk thread. Um, what's that? And they use a very different, different type of sealant. I don't want to, let me see. I don't want to get into that because they'll be like, oh, I can remember that? No, you don't remember that. But it is weird, and you just want to pay attention to it. Um, thinking about this, I'm going to tell you what this, if you read the, I don't have it with me. It's just things coming to my mind. It says something like, and install, let me go back one because, this is correct. So install a double row of silk thread on both sides of the holes. All right. Is this on both sides of the holes? All right. I am going to get a pen out here. Pen. Now, if you're thinking both sides, maybe it should go one on this side and then one on this side. Is that both sides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you would be right. That's both sides. But this is what they mean. Is that one side? And is that the other side? Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is both sides. It's so poorly written. I can't. I'm sorry about that, but that's what they really mean. So. Okay. Yeah. Tips and tricks. Okay, so it's going to be on a spool, just like a sewing thing. All right. You're going to take off, oh, it's about, not quite six feet. So this is six feet. So I'll say five feet. Go ahead and break it. Cut it. Don't try and leave it on the spool. You're going to put your plyo bond down, all right? And, and you can see that you can see through it. It's just enough to tack down uh, the silk thread, all right? And put a little bit of plyo bond in this area, too, because you want to run your string down there. And you got to think about like what, what's oil going to do? You know, it's going to be trying to go this way and this way. Um, so you really have to pay attention. Uh, they messed up right here. I just noticed that. Okay, 
So you have to think about how is the oil going to go. I'll go back to the laser pen. Okay, oil. Oil is going to try and work its way through here. And where's it? it's going to go right there and through that and out. The only way this would be right is if the other case half had O-rings right here. And maybe it does. But if it doesn't, this silk thread had to come down here and go up. Uh -huh. Otherwise, oil is going to go right through there. Okay? Because that's what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to walk up and go, okay, oil, can it get through? Ah, I can get through that. No, you got to redo it. So, but the other side may be cut for O-rings. Probably not because the O-ring's on this side. But anyway, so you make sure it goes through, 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 all the way, and you're fine. Um, this one's okay because that goes in the accessory case. But you're going to put a little plyo bond right there and cut it off about uh, just about a half inch, no more, because too much, and you're going to wish you wouldn't have done that. And you're going to run a double row. Don't try and do one string both. Just do lay in one, and you got to go below that, and then back up, and then below, and back up. Stay away from the cam. You don't want to get gunk in the cam uh, bearings there, the journal. So back up and around. You're going to go all the way down the end. When you get to the end, do the same thing. Put a little plyo bond around the corner. Just tack a half an inch. Don't leave some big old, because what's going to happen, trust me, you, you're going to bump that string, and when you're putting your case halves together, you're going to get it stuck on your finger, and you're going to pull your finger back, and it's all going to come unraveling from the case. Then what do you have to do? Start over. Got to start all over again, <laughs> trying to get the string off you. All right? So, yeah, tack it down there, and then it's going to come. It's going to round around here. And tack it there. Some people do weird things. I don't know, but you got to think about how the oil is going to go. Make sure the oil doesn't go through. I see some people take and run it this way around the top. Well, I say, well, the oil is just going to find its way that way out. So I don't know. Maybe you couldn't see that. Anyway, uh, oh, so much to tell you, but I don't want to bore you. You're you're kind of lucky that you're working with the 290D. This bearing on uh, the front of the light combing is a bit of a booger. And you have this type of bearing, and it fits very nicely in half of the crankshaft, right? Yeah. The other one, the split, is right here. So you actually have to take the bearing, put it on the crankshaft, and, and, and you rotate it. And there's directions in there. But I'm telling you this because you're going to read it. And it's like, so it tells me to put it on, then use a pencil, and then draw the line. It's, because it's for this type of bearing. Um, let me see what I have here. Do I have any more pictures? Yes, so you can see here's the split right here. Mm -hmm. It's split there. So what it tells you to do is to put the bearing in the case without the crankshaft, mark a pencil line right along here, and make some marks like this so you can orientate it. And then you put the bearing itself on the crank, and then, well, the way they do it, they lower the crank and the bearing in. Good luck with that. Uh, I bring the case up too. But... These little holes right here have to line up perfectly inside the bearing. That's what you're trying to do. So one of my guys, he took over building engines as I was headed out, um, called me. Um, what does it mean if I torque the case together and the engine doesn't move anymore? He said it means that you didn't get the bearing there, and these little dowels here pushed into the bearing and seized it up into the crank. That's exactly what he did. So it's easy to do. Uh, did I lose you? Like, yeah, don't repeat it, please, because it's boring. All right, we had sealant. What else do I want to talk about? Well, sealant. Just make sure you read the book on that. Uh, let's go to this. Bearings. Then we'll talk about bearings. Bearings. Well, what is a bearing? Should we define a bearing? Any surface that supports another surface. That supports... Another surface. Now, sometimes I'll use the word bushing. I don't know if I went so far as to put bushing. So what's the difference between a bearing and a bushing? Bushing holds something tight. <laughs> okay. Um, bushing is a plain bearing. Kind of, yeah. I wasn't prepared to answer my own question. Uh, I sometimes use them a little bit of an inter interchangeable. I probably shouldn't. Let me see if I have... Um, a bushing is actually a bearing that has been pressed into something. So, like a perfect example of a bushing is, oh, I, know, I know I found a bushing. Right. <coughs> yep, ro there we go. Rocker arms. Back up. We'll talk about that. This is a bushing right here. So, it's a bearing, yes, but it's properly called a bushing. So, this bronze type 
bushing is pressed into this connecting rod, this connecting rod, and then it is honed or cut to the proper size. Okay, what else do we hear? The rocker arms have a bushing that is pushed inside, and it's actually broached to size. It's pressed to size. Uh, where's another bushing in your engine? The rocker shaft. Rocker shaft have uh, four bushings in them, each cylinder. So, all right, that, those are all bushings. Technically, they're also a bearing, but we call them a bushing. So if I say bushing, and you're like, whoa, wait, what, what's he talking about? That's a bushing. So, all right, uh, what does it do? What does a bearing do functions? Well, I could say, what are the functions? Well, we'll just go with uh, material. Material. Um, I don't want to say this. When you design a bearing, it must meet these criteria. How about that? So the material, let me t the material must be strong enough. Must be strong enough to withstand pressure. So if we think about the plane bearings in your engine, it's a lot of pressure there, and they gotta, they got to be able to withstand to that. So it must be strong enough to withstand pressure. Uh, by the way, since we're talking about bushings there, so you have these bushings in your cylinder that hold the rocker shaft, and they're uh, kind of a bronze, brash color, and they have little holes in them. And those holes, are, they're called oil light bushings by some people. And so they're supposed to absorb and hold oil. And that's what those little holes are for. And so it wouldn't be that uncommon for you to, um, well, let me just ask you this. So if uh, you take out your rocker shaft and your rocker, rocker shaft is all eaten up, the funny thing is, I will say, if you, get, if you get metal in your oil, there we go. Metal contamination in your oil running through the engine, and you pull out your, um, and it goes to the top end, what's going to wear out first? Your bushing, the soft bronze bushing, or the hard rocker shaft? Well, you think the soft thing, right? It's the other way around. Because metal gets embedded into the very soft piece and then acts as an abrasive to destroy the hard piece. So if you pull out a rocker shaft bushing or something, you know, that's very hard, you go, whoa, that thing got eaten up pretty bad. Chances are you have metal contamination stuck in the soft part. So you have to think about it backwards. So, um, okay, so it must be strong enough, but yet permit, permit turning with minimal friction and wear. With minimal wear and friction. Wear and friction. Uh, they are held to a close tolerance, which means when they make them, they're all relatively the same size and they're exactly the right size. So held to close tolerance. Uh, they must provide freedom of movement. If you don't have freedom of movement, you're going to have high Friction, which is going to equate to friction horsepower, which is a loss of horsepower, right? And withstand high loads. Withstand high loads. So it's got to be able to do all that. And what types of bearings do we have? Types of bearings. Well, we got, what do you have in your engine? Plane bearings. AI. Plane bearings. Plane bearings are good for radial. What's a radial load? Round and round. Round is, is radial. So it's able to take the load of that crankshaft spinning in it. So it has radial and thrust loads. And thrust. And thrust loads. All right, so what's a thrust load? <laughs> you want to stand up and do that, MJ? <laughs> It's like a Fortnite dance. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to, to your engine. Where exactly was your thrust bearing? I don't see a thrust bearing in there. See a thrust bearing in there? Did you have a thrust bearing? 
I remember one, two, three, four bearings in your engine. So which one's the thrust bearing? This one. This one? That's only going to handle a radial load. Because it looks just like that one, right? That's only a radial load. Where's the thrust fore and aft? On the far side. Far side. Right there. Far side of number three. Or number two, rather. Right here. Believe it or not, you don't have a thrust bearing that's removable. It is just the case. It's the aluminum piece of the case. There is no replaceable thrust bearing in light combing. This is a continental, small. That's the thrust bearing. Let's so actually turn the corner. And by the way, continental, they're kind of tricky. They have three different types of front main bearings. And some people just buy this one and stick it in. And then when you take it apart, it's all if they put the wrong one in, these things break to pieces. So these are plain bearings with a thrust bearing on it. So we have, so plane will handle radial and thrust loads. Um, material. Material. Um, silver. They were actually made of silver. The, uh, the original Continental six cylinders, the E185s, um, E. 225s, a bigger version, the ones in the V-tail Bonanzas, they use silver bearings. They're incredibly expensive and extremely rare. So there was a point where I was thinking about buying a, uh, a Bonanza, but the one, the my one criteria is it could not have an E engine because I'm like, there's no way I'm ever going to find those bearings again. I built a couple of those and it was just it was terrible trying to find them. Um, the lead, sometimes I made out of lead with an alloy cover or they're just alloy, which consists of um, bronze, bronze. Um, each one of these has its own plus and minus. Like bronze is good under pressure, good under pressure, good under pressure, but has high friction. Um, we have it's my favorite one here. Babbitt. I like that because I don't know what the heck Babbitt is. So I know what Babbitt is. It's something made of tin, copper. You're like, okay, tin, copper. I got this. And antimony. Well, isn't that what you pay your ex-wife? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what the heck that is, but there it is. Um, so not good under pressure, not good under pressure, but has um, low friction. Um, like I said, there's silver. Silver, good under pressure, good heat conductor, friction qualities are not dependable. Good pressure, good, can I abbreviate? Good pressure, um, good under pressure, uh, and undependable, or not dependable friction, not, not dependable in friction. Um, and then you have common alloys. What's an alloy? It's well, no, that's so. If it's magnesium, it's not an alloy. That right? I think that's a thing. It's it's yeah, so an alloy is. Uh, it's it's multiple different metals. But now, what is so magnesium is different metals, or is it one? Yeah, it's one, yeah. But like, uh, well, yeah. So it's a mixture of metals. We'll just go with that before I say something. Um, so steel, so common or steel backed. Steel back. So make a start with the steel backing with silver with silver or silver bronze. And lead sprayed surface. Lead sprayed surface. So now when you look at something like that, you can go, oh, wait a minute, I'm starting to see how my bearings are made. You can see that's got a, a hard steel back, right? It's pretty hard. And you don't have to worry too much about that. Like I said, you can write on that. You can kind of wipe it. You don't have to worry about it. But you turn it over, and on the inside, 
it, they're very fragile, but it's like some sort of lead looking color. And then sometimes you can see a little bit of a gold color underneath it, which is getting down to the silver bronze. So there's that one. And um, well, I've got this is another one here. I put bronze. Oops, bronze. Bronze backed with lead or Babbitt surface. And I will let you take a break. <laughs>